lecture so he will uh, he will uh, just start our meeting by the reciting of holy quran some verse uh, and then uh, well, I will just have a short introduction of few of the program. And actually, uh, so we will give uh, some two minutes to, uh, or one minute to a keynote speaker as a um, professor Wali Jalalzai to put his words on this. And then we'll uh, give the place to you, then you'll start. Is it okay? Sure, thank you. Okay. So I'm inviting my brother uh, to start our meeting by the reciting of some verse of Ali Quran. <clears throat> Thank you so much, brother. Thank you so much. Uh, so uh, I'm just uh, asking and requesting uh, Prof. Said Wali, Dr. Said Wali Jalal Zai, the um, Chancellor of Pakia University, to have his uh, um, uh, start speech. Okay. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good afternoon, Mr. Senior Professor and our colleagues here. Today we have, uh, today we are very happy to have community senior advisor, uh, lecturer from Singapore, Lesana College of Art and Pedagogy. Now I want to share short information regarding this university. The university is one of the top 10 universities among 10 universities on the country level, having eight faculties, medical, agriculture, economics, computer science, uh, language and literatures, education, uh, and politicals. In this university, we are having 209 lectures. Uh, among these lectures, we are having uh, three payment lectures and uh, 7,110 uh, student, students in this university um, uh, from the 30, uh, 34th uh, province of this country. Among these students, we are having 441 students female from, uh, the, uh, from the different province of this country. And we will uh, uh, register for this uh, year 2,750 students new to this university. And uh, we are having in this uh, for this university, 200 more than 200 acres, and uh, uh, actually we work in this uh, land for the greenery of this uh, area also. With this uh, brief introduction, I uh, would like to hear from you uh, about uh, leadership. You uh, have this uh, conference about this university, and uh, thank you so much. 
Uh, okay, thank you so much, uh, Prof. Saeed Wali Jalal Zaid, the Chancellor for Pakistan University. So in a short, uh, I will have a just uh, introduction of Mr. Edmund Chow. However, if I go with English or go with our language. That's good. Okay. So they have their big master that comes like a muskil be a pastute. So the question Okay. So uh, Dr. Edmund Chow has extensive number of years teaching in school and universities. And this year's and this uh, young he has worked with the psychiatric patient and pr uh, prisoners in Singapore, New York, from 2011 to 2012. He lived in Kabul, worked for NGOs to manage a 37 episode radio drama, Women's Empowerment and Entrepreneurship. His PhD research was on Afghan culture and theater. Today, Dr. Imun Cho is the program leader and master program in arts pedagogy and practice at Lassell College at the Earth in Singapore. And fortunately, and we are very happy that Dr. Edmund Chu is uh, now officially a senior advisor for Pakia University. So today uh, we will have him uh, to uh, uh, conduct a seminar uh, uh, on uh, uh, educational leadership and he will share his best practices and leadership types. So then we'll let the mic to him. Uh, before that, Kasai ke katima of Helen online has done, Lot Panami, or do it on an off kunin, Chunma was a flora machine. Uh, Shayat Chiboshan, Kihoboshan, Pomir Sebia, Shahab Seb, the Gakio has done. Ho Kasai ke katima John Carden, Ahmed Ahadiseb Shuma, Misha, or do it on an off kunin. So we'll let the mic to Dr. Edmund Chow, the senior advisor for Pakya University. Thank you very much. Salam to the Chancellor, Professor Dr. Said Wali Jalazai, Vice Chancellor, Professor Dr. Abdullah Ahmadi, the deans, professors, and all who are here today, a very good afternoon to you. My name is Dr. Edmund Chow, and I'm a professor uh, here in Singapore, teaching and managing the postgraduate degree program in arts pedagogy. Um, many years ago, I did my PhD researching on Afghan culture and Afghan theater, specifically looking at social representations of Afghan identities locally and globally. Okay, I need to pause. Do I need a, an interpretation or it's okay so far? It's okay. Uh, Yes, so far, so good. Okay, okay. good. Um, it is a real honor to be here today to share some insights on educational leadership with you. And in today's short lecture, I will cover some areas in leadership theories. And then I will talk about my experience living and working in Kabul. And then we will open up a discussion you know, to see how we can apply some of the principles I'm sharing and making them relevant to our parents. I think you need to mute the microphone. Okay, problem solved because I was checking if I get the sound from that one, but no. Okay. Okay, okay good. Now, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, just carry on. Okay, so let me just have a, a share a quick story with you first. Uh, I have changed the names of the people to protect their identity. So in 2011, I came to Kabul to work uh, for a peace organization. It's an NGO. And I was a project manager for a radio program for women's empowerment, which means to give power to women, right? So one day I was climbing up the stairs to my office and Fauzia was waiting for me at the top of the stairs. And she says, Salam, Mr. Edmund, can we talk? So Fauzia was hired as my radio producer because we were doing a radio show. And I had interviewed many candidates before selecting her and hiring her because she was one of the best of the interviewees. 
And uh, when I saw her standing up at the stairs waiting for me, she looked very worried. So I said, okay, come and meet me in the office. And uh, so I went to the office and then she said, Mr. Edmund, can I leave the office on Tuesday afternoon for my university classes? You know, I will continue my work when I get home and then the radio broadcast will continue. It shouldn't be a problem. So I said, yeah, of course, no problem. You know, I just have to inform my big boss, all right, my big boss. So I entered the, the big boss's office. He was happy to see me. And then I said, good morning, sir. I just want to let you know that our producer, Fauzia, has asked for permission to leave the office earlier on Tuesday to attend her university class. And my big boss says, what did you say? No, no, no. If everyone does the same thing, then who is going to work for me? Now you tell her to change her classes to the evening class. So I left his room and I conveyed the message to Fauzia. And then Fauzia told me something about her problems. And then I went back to see my big boss. And I told my big boss and said, sir, she says this is her last semester. And if she doesn't complete it, she can't graduate, okay? And then my big boss says, I don't care. If she leaves the office, tell her never to come back to work, okay? And then he told me to go. And then as I was walking out the door, he shouted across the room to me and says, Edmund, if you cannot manage your team, I will manage it for you. And so when I was walking out of his office, I was torn in many places. Because you see, I am a teacher. I'm an educator for many, many years. And if I cannot fight for Fauzia's rights for education, then what kind of teacher am I? What kind of educator am I? And, and furthermore, we were doing a, a project on women's empowerment at the NGO. And if she has been denied her rights to study, then there was no empowerment at all, you know? That means this project was also just a show. So I said sorry to Fauzia. And in that moment, she turned away from me, but I saw a tear glistening in her eye. Now, this story shows the contradictions of our attitude towards education. And I'm going to invite you to reflect and think about where you stand on education, especially when it comes to girls' education. Because it is sometimes easy to say, oh, yes, yes, I support education. But in practice, we may be hindering the progress of our children and of our, of our youth. Um, and I know there are issues around safety that we need to be wor worried about. You know, I know there are cultural issues or even political ones that are affecting us every day. And while we consider these contexts, I would like to invite you to also reflect on your personal values and your attitudes towards education in general, because we teach who we are. Okay, I want to repeat that. We teach who we are. Our identities, our values, our prejudices, our likes, our dislikes will become the hidden curriculum and eventually the culture of the university. And because you are professors at Paktia, together we have a collective responsibility towards progress. I'm gonna just pause right now. Yeah, and, and, and maybe- get <coughs> Okay, thank you, brother. So that's, uh, I will ask my colleague because that we, we are all be in the same picture. خاطرين <laughs> چه دا فوزیت دا خبر ما اوگر آغا تول چه نا آغا ول چه جازا نستا دا فوزیت دوه چه دی ما خامی درسون واخلا و آغا امکانم نلارن نو آغا ور تول چه نا جازا ور خبیخی نستا نو دای وای چه کچیر زباده سپروژه که کار کول چه دی خزو ایم پاورمنت وار 
حالان کې دلته خو د ایډوکیشن څخه پاتې سول د ما سره راډیو پروګرامر کې په 18 شپږ خزو منځ کې د کامیاب شو ما ونه سو کول چې د هغه حق د پاره وجنګیږم نو دې لپاره وای موږ او تاسو همیش د پاره وای چې تعلیم ډیر خوښ دی فرض دی او خا... آیا موږ د هغه خبر چې په عمل کې موږ څنګه یو د خزه یا جنکیانه د پاره موږ د آیا موږ او تاسو څومره عملی بڼه دوی ته غور کړی چې د خپل تعلیم مخته بیایي بل خبره دوی د دا وکړله چې دا نه پاتې نه شي ځکه دا مهم موضوع دي چې کله وایي موږ هغه شی درس ورکوو کوم شی چې موږ په خپله یو کله کله نه سن کېم دغه شی درس ورکوو چې خپله یو نو که دې لپاره موږ داسې درس ورکوو چې هغه د خلکو حق ورکوو یا خلکو یعنې په خبره کې کوو چې دوی ته حق ورکوو په عمل کې نه وو نو دا خو وایي کانټریکشن یا نه ګډوډي او موږ او تاسو یعنې د پروفیسران استادان کولی شو چې یو ځایي سره وکولی شو چې د هغې د تعلیم طریقې په بخش کې د تعلیم د پیشه په بخش کې کار وکړو دغه قصه دي که دې دپاره تاسو کوم کوم سوال کوم شاله نشته کنه او ځکه بیا وروسته خبرې اترې زیات دي پکې دلته تیوري ایډیا لري ای تینک وی ار اوکی انټل دس پارټ اینډ جاست وی ار اول ان دا سیم پیکچر یو ستوری یو ایکسپیرینس اباوت دا فوزیا اینډ دین یو ډیوت فور هر because this is uh, practically happening do you want to have a conversation or should i continue with the lecture do you think we want to reflect on the story or okay just uh, you can uh, continue okay. we will have discussion maybe later okay so i will now go to my powerpoint um hold on okay so i want to now cover leadership theories um in business ma- management literature but i just want to manage and and highlight a few okay the first one is what we call um the great man theory all right the great man theory states that leaders are born and they are not made all right leaders are born with certain qualities like charm charisma intelligence and courage and all these cannot be taught or cannot be learned and a great man is a gift from god to mankind do you want to interpret uh you have to theory by the zarat the great man theory they know they love okay say again okay so next okay so we may not agree with some of the examples that i'm going to share but to many people some of the great men include people like abraham lincoln over here Uh, he was born into poverty in indiana in the united states and through self education he became a lawyer and then became the 16th president of the united states and then in 1862 he issued the emancipation declaration that helped to end the slavery in the united states genghis khan uh, he was the mongol leader who conquered and ruled most of modern day russia china korea southeast asia persia india middle east and eastern europe genghis khan mm-hmm. yeah mustafa kamal atatürk he abolished the ottoman empire and became the founder and the first president of turkey all right and then the famous one alexander the great he overthrew the persian empire conquered the eastern mediterranean egypt middle east and parts of asia salaram sir and um all these examples so far are people who come from the perspective of war and violence right they're political leaders who 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 advocated war and violence but if we were to think about people who are not about war and about violence but about peace would be people like martin luther king and muhammad gandhi for example and uh, in afghanistan i think it would be okay to assume that malalai of my one belongs to this group of Malala. great men yeah. and women because she saved the soldiers from defeat at the second anglo afghan war and using her head scarf as a flag she sang a lande to the soldiers and her story appears in primary school textbooks in afghanistan and she's probably the only woman I I could be wrong but I think she's the only woman to be given such a high social status right okay so the second leadership theory is called the trait theory 
Here, leadership qualities and traits can be learned and acquired through practice. The theory states that traits can produce predictable patterns of behavior. And some of these traits are intelligence, personality, confidence, decisiveness, optimism, integrity, cooperation, adaptability, and flexibility. Um, do we need an interpretation over here for this one? Uh, okay. No, no, I just you can go as okay. softly. There's no problem. All right. So then the third theory of leadership is called the behavioral theory, right? And in this theory, leaders are not made, but they, I mean, leaders are not born, but they are made. That means anyone can become a leader, right? You, me, our children can become a leader. And this means focusing on what great leaders do and following exactly what they do, what they say, and how they think, because they think that you know, great leaders have certain kinds of behavior, all right? Now, the last one, the fourth theory I want to introduce is called transformative leadership. So far in the last three theories, we have talked about, what we have talked about is about me, me, and me as a leader, right? But as a transformative leader, um, a transformative leader is one who talks about the followers, right? the people who follow the leader. So a transformative leader motivates the followers, understands their needs, and gives them ownership of the work. This leader sees himself or herself as a role model to the followers. And that is important, right? Because it means um, if I say something, I need to be able to demonstrate to you that I can also do it. So it means walking the talk, right? It's no longer just a person who says, do this, but then I, I can't do it, yeah? So walking the talk is an important quality of transformative leadership. Now, with this kind of role modeling, um, a transformative leader inspires a group identity to work towards a collective vision of the organization and constantly challenges them to innovate and change with the times. Okay, I'm going to pause and see whether you need an interpretation. So far, it's okay? So good, no problem. Okay. You can carry on. <laughs> All right, good. Okay. All right, now I'm going to summarize I think Kumjaita, uh, maybe uh, it was. What is it? Uh, just one, one second, because uh, there's some, no, 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 internet. I should recheck LLV. I didn't uh, internet, but I think it's a single issue. That's an issue, that Okay, brother, you can just now carry on the. Okay. Are you still seeing my 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 screen? Is the PowerPoint on at the moment? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We see. Yeah. Okay. See so right now, um, give me a second. I want to summarize these four theories, okay? And the first three, like I said, has been focusing a lot on individual greatness. It is about me as a great leader. And the advantage is that the leader can become a symbol of hope and courage, just like Malalai of Maiwan has been for many Afghans, right? Now, the disadvantage of these three theories is that the leader can create a culture of fear and domination because people can become afraid of this leader and this culture can become very oppressive. Yeah? Transformative leadership, on the other hand, focuses on the organization itself because the leader is there to support the goals of the organization. So think of the university, right? The transformative leader thinks of the goals of the university 
So the leader is usually very democratic, you know, and focuses on how to get the people there, how to get the people to accomplish the goals and the mission of the university or of the organization. Interpretation? Is it okay? No, no, just okay. okay. Now, next, I'm going to simplify the theories into two metaphors. All right, the two metaphors would be the first one the three theories can be represented as the strict father. The strict father disciplines the child to make sure that, you know. Uh, he or she needs to learn to do what is right and not to do what is wrong. A strict father wants to make sure the child becomes independent and mature. And if the child fails to do so, the strict father will let the child learn from his own mistakes and will not interfere, uh, interfere or help. Okay. Now, the last theory, the transformative leadership, can be represented as the nurturing parent. Now, this nurturing parent is usually like a mother, you know, believing that the child deserves fairness and opportunity to grow. The nurturing parent gives the child freedom to make choices. And this parent makes sure that there is two-way honest communication. The parent knows that the child belongs to the community. And so the child, you know, should grow up and be of service to the community. Okay. Now, the relevance to, uh, to education is this. So we take a look at the first three theories again. Many of us have arrived at our level of status as a professor in the university through hard work, through studies, and through determination. You know? And that is something we need to be proud of. Now, however, if our job as a professor is to keep our status and power, then we are not truly in the business of education. Because if whatever I say or do is right and you should not be questioning me, then we can become oppressive. All right? If I do not feel the need to upgrade my skills or learn new things on the job, then I become a guru because a guru has achieved greatness already. But that's not necessarily a good thing because this is like my boss at the NGO saying, you know, well, I hired you to do what you need to do. You don't tell me what I should do. You know, if you don't do this, you will be out of this job. And similarly, as a lecturer or as a professor, sometimes you tell your students, you do this and you will pass. If you don't do this, you will fail. All right. And, and, and so this, there is no spirit of thinking. You only produce. Uh, one more sentence first. You only produce obedient students whose knowledge has no relevance in the world. Okay, Manawi, what would you like to interpret so far? Uh, just, just one second. Uh, okay, uh, let me check the. Okay, so far so good. You can carry on. Okay, good. All right, so um so I'm going to encourage you to move beyond the status of the guru over here to become a facilitator or a guide. You know, a mentor, a mentor who is there to help the learner achieve greatness. A learner, uh, to help the learner enjoy learning. So when you are a mentor, you have the knowledge of a guru, but you are humble enough to say, Let's find out together. Let's discover this together. You know, so knowledge becomes joyful. It's a joyful pursuit. You know, with that attitude of discovery, 
our learners become problem solvers and they can now function in society as active citizens. Any questions so far? Nanawi? I can't hear you. Are you there? Are you okay? <laughs> can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you now. Okay, so okay, we will directly. Okay, you can just proceed. Uh, are you waiting for me, or are you doing oh, some yes. in interpretation? Yeah, carry on. Okay, so now, right now, um, I've talked about the, the, the three, the four theories, right? We talked about how the theories have been relevant to parenting, but also to educators, and, and also to move away from the guru kind of a leadership to one being in a facilitator of learning, right? And I'm going to now share uh, one episode of something I did when I founded the teacher training clinic. Um, where Akram from Kandahar asked me a question. You know, he said that uh, there's a young boy refusing to enter his kindergarten. And then the answer, even though it's relevant to a kindergarten child, it's also going to be relevant to a university lecturer. So maybe we can watch the video. Okay. So Manawi? There's a voice, right? I am sure that we shall try to find and bring them. I am sure we shall Okay, brother, I think uh, I just uh, some technical problem occurred. You can play it. Do you have it? The clip? I'll, I'll play it from my side then. Okay, you can play it. Because okay, so I'll, play, I'll play it from my side. Okay. Uh, share screen. Hi, Mr. Edmund Chow. Hope you are fine and doing well. This is Muhammad Akram reaching you out from Kandahar, Afghanistan. Uh, one of the most common problems we face here is uh, there are some students, the new comers to the school, and they are supposed to come to school and enter, for example, kindergarten classes. The problem is that their parents haven't pulled uh, the love or the desire of coming to school. So these students, whenever they come to school, they don't want to enter the class. They just say that I don't want to enter the class. And also they have the fear of uh, being beaten by the teacher. 
although there is nothing here, something like that. But still, they, this, these kind of students, they have uh, heard that kind of stories from other students that they get beaten at schools. So therefore, they have that kind of fears and the love or the desire of going to school. They don't know that also. And these students, whenever they come to school, they want to be outside the class. They want to be with their elder brothers. So one of the most common problems that today I face is this kind of problem. Uh, I hope it doesn't bother you to give us some advices about this type of issue. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much again. Hope you have a great time. Bye. You know, when children are afraid to go into a school, it's probably because the parents had frightened them. So this is a parenting issue. You know, it means parents had already instilled fear in the children. And, you know, you might hear them say things like, you know, if you don't go to school, I beat you. Um, or if you don't do your homework, I'll kill you clean you or your teacher will hit you or you might even have heard parents say this to a child you better behave if not I will smack you or I will ground you at home and you are not allowed to go outside so this kind of language you know if this kind of language and punishment already exists at home there is no wonder the child does not want to go to school there is the feeling of resentment. He or she might be thinking, I don't want to go to school, but you're forcing me. I hate you, mommy. I hate you, daddy. So that kind of resentment boils up in the child and, and he or she does not want to enter the premises. Personally, I don't agree with this kind of parenting, but it is not my place to address this as this is a cultural issue. So let me address the school environment issue. Let's just imagine that the child is standing outside the school, refusing to enter. But if he or she hears other children laughing and making noise in a fun way, just like playing in a playground, you know, this will make the child curious and want to join in the fun. They won't feel frightened anymore. In fact, they don't want to be left out of the fun. You know, I remember visiting the Afghan Mohammed Circus in Kabul. Before the classes began, the children were juggling balls, spinning the diablo, and running around kicking a football, and having a lot of fun. And even as an adult watching them, I felt like joining in as well. And so laughter is a great way to break down resistance, break down the fear. So this is a very quick answer. As educational leaders, it is very important to create the culture of your school environment and to make it conducive for children to learn, to play, to make mistakes without fear, without judgment. You know, I'm not saying that punishment has no place in school. I'm saying that rules are there to guide children. And when rules are broken, they must learn to take responsibility for their actions. But in your case, fear had already crippled this child from entering a place of learning. So we need to undo that and help the child succeed in a fun and engaging way. For those who want a little theory to help you understand concepts in practice, I'm going to introduce a very um, a, a, a theory, very briefly, called the Control Value Theory of Achievement Emotions. You know, it states that academic learning and emotions are closely intertwined, right? Uh, more precisely, when emotions are tied to achievement outcomes, such as performing a task. Well, let's give an example. Um, in a preschool context, the, the task could be the ability to tie your shoelaces or the ability to jump across hoops, or the ability to count from 1 to 10. 
in Dari, in Pashto, in English, for example, right? And when this is executed well, the learner activates pleasant emotions such as pride and joy for performing well. But if the learner fails the task, for example, unpleasant emotions such as shame and anxiety are activated. So these are what Prof. Reinhard Peikrund calls achievement emotions. Now this diagram you see exemplifies the different emotions that we need to activate in a classroom. Though these are related to activities and performance tasks in the classroom, there is also research to show that students feeling interested, being curious about what they're going to learn and experience with the positive effects on motivation and learning. So that is why I'm suggesting that promoting a school culture with lots of laughter and fun is a good way to foster learning. And this principle is the same at home as well. Provide a place for curiosity, not fear. I hope this answers your question. So if you have a question for me, write me a message, record your voice message. Okay, um, I'm going to go on to the next example. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. So um, the next example is the Kanko exam. <laughs> we all know this. And uh, this is an issue that, you know, I, I would like to address. And whenever I see photos of students sitting outside uh, to take their Kanko exams, I always read messages like, oh, we're very proud of our children, for our teenagers who are showing determination, even in hardship, right? Um, yeah, I think, I think their resilience and determination need to be applauded, right? But from an educational leadership perspective, we have failed our youth and our children because number one, if they do not take the Kankor, they will not be able to enter the university. So even if they have to sit in the snow, they will have to endure the cold. You see, they, they do not have a choice, right? And we have failed our children and our teenagers for the second reason is that we did not give them the conditions to succeed. What I mean by that is that, you know, in transformative leadership, we create the conditions for learning. Um, we create the paths towards success as an organization. And in this case, we did not provide them a conducive environment or a safe enough environment to take the exams. Because if I'm worried about the snow, I'm worried about the sand or the, the, the wind and the sun, I can't really be focusing on the exams. So it's not a fair assessment of their intellectual ability, but there are a lot more things affecting their concentration, right? So the conditions of the environment are harsh. And if we cannot provide safety and shelter, I think we have failed our youths. And uh, on Twitter, I saw this on Twitter that they talked about a kanko. And one person says, this is exactly how I wrote my university entrance exam 20 years ago. Was sitting uh, on the snow throughout the exam time in the brutal winter of Ghazni city. Despite the cold, I was happy and excited for the future and for where my pen was about to take me to that day. Another says, my grandfather is from Ghazni as well. And he would always tell me stories as a kid, how he'd write exams and tests on the grass outdoors. Crazy how 80 years later is the same. Okay, let's think about that. 80 years ago, we, this issue was already there. And even today, nothing has changed. And I know corruption is an issue that needs to be discussed. Again, but it's not my place to discuss that. All right? But from an educator's perspective, the conditions for learning are our responsibility. And if we don't change the system, we will continue to perpetuate a system of oppression. Okay, is there a need to translate or interpret? Yeah. 
Kampur was very good. Sir, uh, exactly I want to say regarding this Kampur exam, intelligence exam, uh, actually these years, uh, this, uh, from last five years, we are having this exam uh, inside the class, not out the door, uh, outside. But one, one problem is here still we have, but this uh, subject exam uh, of the faculty, this problem we are having, but actually uh, we have planned for that. Actually, you know, regarding the Afghanistan, so here it's what uh, from the years, uh, uh, what is going on. Still, uh, up to now, here in Kandis, still fighting is going on. In this situation, it will be difficult to change this, uh, these things. But uh, uh, your presentation will give us very good information. And we will uh, uh, work on this. Uh, actually, uh, in Pakistan University, now we have a gymnasium. Uh, that's very really big uh, building, and we will plan for that for a whole university. How can we, we manage this uh, subject exam uh, for the time uh, timetable? We will make timetable for this. Each lecturer uh, should have the exam time, and uh, they will take exam at that, uh, at that exact time. But still, uh, you are right, we have a problem. Uh, not only in uh, Pakya province, uh, even in the whole uh, uh, 34 province. But our governments uh, now, uh, they are thinking about the situation, how we can get peace, uh, like, uh, how to bring the peace to this country. This uh, situation will change in the next two years. Actually, about Pakya University now, we, will, uh, we have a plan for these things to uh, deprive this problem from this university. Uh, we are having some uh, uh, daily class uh, uh, in this university. We will manage for the exam for next year. But uh, you gave given us very good uh, uh, information regarding this. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, uh, okay, do you hear me, brother? Yeah, not very clearly. Uh, I, I heard it, but I, there's a bit of an echo. Um, yeah. Is there anything you want me to address or can I continue? Continue? Can you hear me? Yes, now I can hear you. Yeah, yeah. Can you? Okay, wait. One delta. 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 Yes, I can hear can you. Can you hear me? Yes. I, yeah, okay. I can. I, I can hear so, you. Yeah. Prof. Jalaze, uh, Prof. Jalaze puts. Okay. Did you go, did you go, did you get the Prof. Jalaze comments or a little bit here and there, maybe a few a few points to summarize a little bit. Okay. So. Now I can't hear you. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you. But you're oh. a, a bit far from the microphone. So that's why oh, it's yeah. a... Let me give you some internet issues. So anyhow, uh, did you get the Prof. Jalazai comment on the Kampur examination? Can you hear me? Yes, uh, yes, I can. Okay, so just Prof. Jalazai put some comment that right, right now the procedure changed a little bit and we're all up on for the concrete examination. But we're still fighting for the appropriate location. We've got just like a month ago, we have inaugurated the big uh, hall as a gymnasium, but sometimes we're using that one for the general examination of university. So we'll prepare the uh, schedule so we will solve that one, but they are happy that you got this kind of example, especially from Afghanistan and Pakistan University. So I think I'll share. Okay. So.
So carry on, brother, carry on. Okay, we'll carry on. All right. Um, all right. So I'm now going to introduce you to a, another educator. So there was once um, an educator in Brazil called Paulo Freire. And he noticed that physical punishment was used by parents and teachers at home and in school, similar to what we were talking about just now. Um, you know, the, 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 the Akram talking about the child very afraid to go to school. So this happened in Brazil. And uh, then in 1961, Freire was asked to develop literacy programs for the illiterate farmers because it's a very agricultural country, right? Um, and he realizes that one of the reasons these farmers were oppressed by the landowners is because they could not read and write. And so when the farmers signed the deed, they, they were basically giving their livelihood away to the landowners because the farmers had to cultivate the land and then give away the food and the crops as rent, right? And so that means nothing is left for the farmer. And so they become like modern day slaves being exploited by a legal system that they could not change. Okay. All right. Okay. So in order for them to know what legal documents they were agreeing to, Freire created a literacy program that used words that they, 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 they need to know, you know. For example, um, words like plow, the land, uh, harvest, crop, rain, brick. And when they learned these words, they were then uh, visually represented in pictures, all right? And, and they were contextualized and explained based on the farmer's experiences. Because as a farmer, you're not educated, right? So you only know what you're doing with your hands. But once you connect the land, the, the, the action and the word, it starts to make sense, right? So much later, the farmers were then able to understand what they were signing on the deed. And later, they were able to resist the system of oppression. Okay, should I move on? Okay. Okay. Now, similarly, so Freire talks about this, right? Similarly, the relevance in education is that the lecturer is not there to deposit information to the learner. You know, he calls this a banking education, like someone pouring information into the brain like this. And that to him is wrong because the role of the educator is, is to develop critical thinking and reflection so that the learner can transform his or her own reality, just like how the farmer can transform his world of being oppressed by the landowner. So as educators, we are not making students passive agents of learning, but to become active agents of their own lives. He calls this critical pedagogy, right? Um, Ferry wants leaders who do not act dialogically but insist on imposing their decisions, do not organize the people. You know, they manipulate them instead. They do not liberate, nor are they liberated. They oppress. So this is a warning for us in education, that educational leadership is really about liberating the learner, not domesticating them. Any questions so far? Oh. Okay, now let, let me share some photos with you when I was working in Kabul uh, in 2011 and 2012. Uh, this man, or this, as you can see, this is uh, Daryl Laman Pilas <laughs> many years ago. <laughs> this has changed so much now. Um, and this man was the guard at the NGO I was working. So one day our organization went to Karagal Lake and then we went for lunch. And then after lunch, we were just walking around and he says, Edmund, Edmund, and then he start, started carrying me. <laughs> and then another guard, another security guard saw it. And then he flung me over his shoulders. 
<laughs> and you know, I was honestly very worried because as you can see, the railing is where the waist is. And if he accidentally fell, you know, I would probably fall down and, and I would probably die, <laughs> you know? And you can see me trying to hold on to his arms for support. I was so scared. And, and as you can see, you know, even after that, I don't know what happened. Even after that, when I was playing football with my colleagues from the NGO, uh, this, this colleague started carrying me like a baby. <laughs> it's quite funny, but very unusual for me, right? I'm from Singapore. I'm not used to this. <laughs> I don't know if this is an Afghan culture, but it's very unusual. And so I was thinking, maybe I'm very, very short. You know, maybe because uh, Afghans are very, very tall and that's why they enjoy carrying me like a baby, you know. Uh, but this made me, you know, maybe that was the reason. But I think the real reason I wanted to share with you is that maybe uh, is that I, I saw my colleagues and, and even the people I worked with in the organization as equals. You know, they didn't see me as a project manager with a lot of authority and power over them but we were almost on equal standing. So I think the reason is that they, they, they could relate to me. You know, it's a relationship of power that is shared. It's not a top-down power in the relationship, but it's, it's, it's someone that they can relate to and they can talk to, they can be friends with, uh, you know, but at work, then they will, will, they will take the orders. Very unlike the NGO boss telling me in a top-down manner that, you know, he will fire the radio producer. So that in itself are two examples of leadership approaches. Let me also share an example. Uh, for me as an outsider, I wanted my Afghan friends to also learn about my culture because like I talked about, it's going to be a two-way communication, right? So when I was in Afghanistan, I had to celebrate Chinese New Year. Uh, you see, I'm ethnically Chinese. My grandparents came from China, but I'm born in Singapore, right? Uh, and Chinese New Year, I wanted to, to send Chinese New Year greetings to my family back in Singapore. And so I taught my Afghan friends how to say Chinese New Year in, in, in my language. So this is the video. They're carrying me again. <laughs> okay, so I asked them to speak Chinese. Action. <laughs> Uh, my brother teach me some 
Chang is like Xi Jinping. No. Like Xi Xi. Like Wu Ai Bi. Like Wu Ai Bi. Yeah, Xi Xi. Let's go Shefan. Okay, Shefan. 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 Thank you. First, I want to make a good sentence. Then I will, I will tell you. Okay. Stop the record. Hilaram, Hilaram, Chipanui, Kalkita, Koshala, Au, Aramos. Englishy? Englishy? Vale. We wish that you will have a good life in the future and also in security. This one, my family, I wanted to send a message to them. Um, last. Yeah, do say, let me hear you. <laughs> okay, we're going to stop for a while. Uh, before we, I'm going to read a poem. Um, are there any questions so far? my colleague has just question discussion I will show you. What's the question? Can you hear me, brother? Yeah, I can hear you. You want to help me interpret? As we talk about transmitted leadership, yes. All finally we come across that we will uh, apply in our education system the transformative leadership. Yes. Can't so hear now, you very well. Can't hear you very well. Can 
Can you hear me now, brother? Yes, very good. Now, yes. Uh, can you hear? Yes. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, very soft, suddenly. Mm -hmm. Very soft right now. Can you hear me? It's still a bit soft. Are you okay. speaking to the computer? I'm, yes, I'm a little bit near to computer. Maybe I will come more. Okay. A little now better. You... Yeah, a little better. So one of our lectures just put the comments that finally we, uh, we love to be a transmittive leader. Yeah. So the thing is right now we have so many restriction problem from the... Morning in progress. 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 Okay, okay, no problem. I just uh, one, two, three. Ah, okay. So, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Yes. By so, like, this problem, for example, uh, uh, more people are introduced from the Ministry of Higher edu Education every year to the university. We have limited places, spaces, and we have more student and class. We have less lecturers. Considering this problem, how to be a very nurturing parent or how to be a good to help your student, uh, I mean, to get a good result. Okay. Um, I'm not sure how much flexibility or autonomy your the university can 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 have to create new classes for these students. Because uh, again, I'm not sure how the policies work in Afghanistan. Uh, like you said, there are a lot of students coming in, but you only have very limited places. Um, so the, the natural answer is to say to open up more classes, but then that means you don't have enough professors <laughs> or, or professors taking a lot of classes and then you get overworked. Um, so I don't have an immediate answer right now, but I think this is a structural logistical issue that needs to go up all the way to the Ministry of Higher Education um, so that uh, they, they can oversee some of these problems. Um, I think, yeah, I, I, I don't have an immediate answer right now. That's okay. So no problem because we will have a continued discussion in the future. Okay, so should I continue with the poem now? I will, this is the last part of my uh, uh, lecture, my, my slides. So, so actually, the Ministry of Higher Education of Afghanistan so decided for this issue to solve this problem in the, uh, our university. Uh, actually, we have quality assurance program in Afghanistan for each university. We have a uh, different stage uh, for each university. In that, we are having the student centered learning system. Uh, what you said in your uh, presentation. Uh, we should uh, 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 interact with the students. Uh, for example, when you say something regarding some subject, we have to give some time for the student also. This problem, but uh, uh, in each class, we have more, more students, uh, less opportunity for the lecturers. Uh, actually, we have 7,011, uh, 110 students in this university, but uh, our lecturers said 209. Uh, 209 lectures will be divided by the students. It's very less opportunity to, uh, to, how to solve this problem. But our uh, government, our plan for this uh, situation, for this problem to solve in the future, uh, they are working on this issue with the uh, university, the Ministry of Higher Education, working with the ministry, uh, with the university, but uh, practically, we, uh, we, we are unable to uh, apply. Later, we will apply this uh, system also. 
I don't know. Okay, um, I, I I heard bits and pieces. So again, I think the logistical issue, right? Is is this still the the topic we're talking about? Yes, logistic. Yes, yeah. Also- so I'm just thinking right now that if if there are classes that can, um, you know, we have limited classrooms as well in our university. So sometimes we have to take, you know, different timing so that different students can come into this class for a different class, um, so that the classrooms are constantly being used. Because if there is a time, let's say for one hour, um, that is left empty, that means we are also... <laughs> um, we're not allowing <laughs> classes to come in. Does it make sense? I don't know. It's, it's, I think it's more on the logistical issue that we need to think about. Yeah, there are, there are certain problem that this our government should be involved. Uh, we are working to work on having a standard class around 35 students, but that is hard right now for us to manage because we, we tell every year to the Ministry of Higher Education that we need 200 students for Patea University. They send more than six, 700, more than 1,000 of students to Patea University. So we don't have sometimes the right to kind of deny them, we say, okay, most welcome. So then there will be a side of rain of student only. In every class got 100, 120, 130 student, and the, the lecture got just 40 minutes or 30 minutes to deliver a speech or to deliver a, a lecture. There's just time to teach and escape from the class. There won't be a time to leave uh, or ask the student to participate in your classes. So that is hard to implement ER student central learning system right now. But we are working toward to at least the government should help us and the Ministry of Higher Education. They should put some, they allocate some of budget that we should have more buildings, more classes, and they should hire <laughs> Why can I? Adam Khilsa Chirte. Okay, let, let's give the mic for Adam Khilsa because you like to impose his question. Okay, wait, wait. I, I want to respond. Um, because you have an overpopulation, I think you may need to change the way you teach. So instead of getting everybody into the classroom to teach, potentially you are giving you're breaking up the student population into groups where they teach themselves. You know what I mean? It is, it is a very different kind of a, a way of teaching. It's not, you know, you have to figure out a way where maybe 10 people in one group, another 10 people in one group. So each 10 will be given very specific things to do. Each group will have maybe a project to do. So then they are, it's all project-based you know, problem solving kind of a a pedagogy rather than just content. Because when we start thinking about content and and banking information, right, then they must attend classes, they must attend lectures. But if you move away from the banking education that they don't need to sit in lectures to learn, then you just give them a problem to solve and then they have to find a way to solve the problem. And if they cannot solve the problem, they need to tell us or tell you why they cannot solve the problem. And that doesn't mean it's wrong because it may not be a problem that can be solved, but when they discover the different things, then their learning is is hands-on, is experiential. It it becomes more relevant to them. But the the, the issue is more complicated because we have not got one subject to teach. Every lecturer got more than two or three subjects to teach. So if you divide these classes into middle groups, it would be hard to manage it the whole day. Uh, we are also during the night. But these are the problems. Uh, where you should have that in your mind even for the next meetings. So we will think to find some ways or way to manage it. Yeah. But the thing we introduce students to the society, they should participate from their courses. So this is what interdisciplinary learning is all about. So interdisciplinary learning is when you move beyond your own discipline and you mix with another discipline, right? So on a very, very simple uh, perspective, if, if I'm a student from business, I can be uh, partnered up with another person from engineering. And then we go to the river and we discover new things about 
some problems that the 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 engineering problems and then from a business perspective how can the business person look at it look at the same problem but with a very different set of lenses you know so maybe uh, because we need to creatively solve the problem if we wait for the ministry to to solve your problems nothing will will move right <laughs> so i think the university needs to find a way to creatively solve your own problems by um, reducing the time, making it project-based, making it interdisciplinary, you know, so that they all learn from each other uh, and then they come to the lecturers only for consultation. Maybe, I'm not sure. So it's almost like a thesis, mini thesis, yeah? All right, I'm going to go on with my, uh, the end of the, the, the presentation. So I'll share my screen again. And I'm going to invite someone to read this poem. This poem is by Hafiz. Okay. Um, can anyone read aloud for us, please? Ahadisar, um, Yeah. Okay, so he's not responding. So I will read this, this poem and it will be short. هذه <laughs> آمد به گوش ناگه هم آواز بلبلی مسکین چو من به عشق گل گشته مبتلا و در چمن تکنده ز فریاد غلغلی می گشتم من در آن چمن و باغ دم بده می کردم من در آن گل و بلبل تا ملو گل یار خسن گشته و بلبل قریم عشق آن را تفضل و نه این را تبدیل چون کرد در بلم اثر آواز اندلی برا بلبل فرکنم گشتم چنان که هیچ نماندم احمولی بس گل شگفته می شود این باغ را ولی کس بی بلای, کس بی بلای خار نچید است آواز از او گلی حافظ مدار امید فرج از مدار چرخ دارد هزار عید و ندارد تفضل و در شیر در مطلب داره چه باغوان می جزه باغ تا ولارم چه او میلی کرد گل بشد و پاکیدو که وقت او بلبل میولی کرد او دیده بلبل فریاد نه تا پوشتم چه در بلبل در گل سر اصول در می ندارم نوزه هم با در گل بانی مایت سولم او در گل تا می مثلا نوگو یا دیگه مدیرت ماو کنم دل تا کلا چه وای ما گل تا لاس کنم چه گل وش کنم مختی دیگر چیزا گل وش کنم پلاس می زیغان می کنم مطلب داده چه کلا تا گل یعنی خلا هدف ترسی گرد گل بلا سروریه میزه باید می نویم و کلا چه هدف ترسی گرد تا مشکلات هم سنم از غیست دارد و چه گل بلا سروریه از غیب هم نگیم او ده غرق هم نرز نبیم و خدای رو بیش سهی تشکر بیمی و عدد داده چه تا بده و سوال بیه چه خبر ده دی باغوان سو خبر ده گل بل سو او دی گل سو دیدی اگه که مناطاس با خل Okay, brother, I think uh, I'm done with the translation. I okay. <laughs> okay, good. Thank you. So right now, I, I chose this poem um, by Hafiz, I think because of very important images of the rose, the nightingale, and the gardener, right? There are three love relationships between the gardener and the, the flower, right? The flower needs the gardener. So the, there's a love relationship between the gardener and the flower. And then there's a love relationship between the flower and, and, and the bird, right? The bird and the flower. So there's another love relationship having, uh, you know, in, in this poem. Um, and then there's another love relationship after seeing this, is that now how can the gardener help the bird come closer to the rose? So there are three relationships that we're looking at. And sometimes um, things do not, are not in our power. Just like the 
things happening in the environment, the, the bird flies through the air, uh, you know, the bird can do some things and the flower can only do some things, but the gardener is also the one who is nurturing. We talk about the nurturing parent. It's the one who nurtures the garden that makes things blossom and, and, and makes it work, right? So that's the reason why I chose this poem. But I want to ask you also to slow down, to think about the thorns, you know, the rose has these thorns. Um, what are the thorns that exist in your higher education? And we already talked about one of those, uh, it's the logistics and the overpopulation, right? So brainstorm are the thorns that exist and then discuss in your group how you can add value to Paktia University to make it a great university. Because you are now nurturing parents, right? Nurturing educators. Maybe we can just take about five minutes and then after that I might want to conclude. Do you think that would be okay? Five minutes? Discussion, five minutes for discussion. Okay, yeah, that's fine.
Okay, brother. Uh, are you alive? <laughs> What's the discussion about? Okay, you're still alive because uh, the task is I think done. I just summarize what we have discussed already. Okay. Okay, so can you hear me well? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, so finally, we summarized it before we had lots of problems, security issues, you know, instability, uh, logistics, and so many things that uh, we even have also sometimes in our university. Uh, the, I mean, the educational staff readiness, I mean, the academic staff. But these are the terms that we will work toward to fill this gap. But actually about the poem, this poem, it was about the flower, the gardener, and the, uh, and the bird. So actually we come across finally that the flower is our curriculum, our subjects that we are teaching. And the, 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 the bird is the students. And the gardener is the lecturers, because the more we focus on the flower, we, we, we are just kind of nurturing the flower. Uh, in the same time, the birds who are the student, they can get good benefit. They can create very good love bonding with the flower. At the same time, when we are nurturing the, the, the flower, I mean, the, the curriculum developing, or we are teaching in the best way, so it means uh, that we also create a very good love bond with our flower. But at the same time, when we uh, give good, I mean, when we feed the flower and the birds also creating a very good bond, love bond with the flower. So we are kind of highing, uh, I mean, rising the volume of the university. So that become a quality assurance. Finally, this was our discussion. Great. I think this is a great uh, metaphor. Um, are there any other questions before I conclude today's presentation? I, I will just... I think, yeah, doctor have one question. Okay. She asked, can you explain to you the hard situations of our academic field? If you please uh, respond us that how can we adapt and overcome these hard conditions, like huge number of students and less number of student, uh, 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 lecturers and less number of students, and uh, how we are keeping, how we will keep these the best quality in our uh, job, in our uh, uh, lecture, giving lectures to the students. How can we adapt what and something lectures? So in between, I, I missed the message. How can we, can we rephrase the question? Um, How we, can we manage these hard conditions? For example, like a huge number of lecture, uh, uh, students and less numbers of lecturers. And how we are keeping, how we will keep best quality. So I, I, I think I will repeat his uh, question. Yeah. It's a doctor doctor is stating that right now we have huge number of students, but we have less number of lecturers. How we keep high quality of teaching? Your mind is awesome. Um, I don't think the quality of teaching has to do with the number of students and the number of lecturers, because at the end of the day, it's your relationship with your students. So if I'm going to be the, the leader in the classroom who thinks that, okay, because I'm the guru, you, you just follow what I say, what I do, and you pass, then again, that kind of banking education is not going to produce quality students because they're not critically thinking for themselves. But if you, even if I'm the one person teaching this class, for example, then my relationship with the students and my, my attitude towards the, the, the material, the curriculum, is that we are discovering things together. I'm here to help you understand or even for me, I need to unlearn some of the things so that I can learn together with the student. So then it becomes um, a, 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 an inquisitive kind of an environment 
to promote critical thinking. Okay, I think. Yeah. Uh, so let me conclude. Um, I started the lecture today talking about my NGO work, right? About Fauzia, about you know the two types of leadership, and I reflected how I might have failed Fauzia for not defending her and fighting for her rights to education. Um, you see, for me, I'm demonstrating also the kind of reflection I do as an educator. Whether I'm working for an NGO or whether I'm teaching in a classroom, I constantly sit and reflect on my role and my values. And this is what I think I'm trying to also demonstrate to you, that even as educators and leaders in the classroom, you need to be constantly thinking and reflecting so that we can better ourselves at work and at home, yeah? Then I went on to share the different theories on leadership and suggested that transformative leadership, especially in the tradition of critical pedagogy offered by Paulo Freire, the Brazilian, uh, is perhaps one way we can transform our situation in Afghanistan, you know, so that every learner becomes literate enough to change the reality. Because, for example, if we keep saying, I mean, I understand the security issue is real. And, and right now, even as we speak, a lot of families are displaced, right, because of, of what's happening in, in all across Afghanistan. So we're not saying that those things are not real, those security issues are real. But if today is all I have with my classroom, then this is what I have with you, right? But I need to be able to also change uh, my, my reality. But the, the, the system, some, the sometimes that we do in the university is that we don't allow people to think out of the box or to think critically or to question the systems, right? Because we, we don't want them to be uh, critical. We want them to be obedient. And that, that perpetuates a cycle of illiteracy and, and a cycle of oppression, right? So what I'm suggesting is that we professors need to focus more on the learners and to democratize learning, right? To make learning more accessible to everybody so that the power relations between professors and students is not uh, one determined by authority, power or status, but one governed by, governed by love and generosity. Just like, you know, Hafiz's poem between a gardener, the nightingale and the rose. Thank you. So much. Okay, brother. Uh, as a final remarks, zillion of things from you. Thank you so much for this. Uh, Thank you. Time. You work on it, and you put all of your energy. I know how hard it was that you work. You prepared. I know you cheered the time that you give us time. So, hardly. I mean, myself, I mean, I mean, we are really appreciating and thank you very much, brother, for this useful and very immense leadership program. We learned a lot and we will share the video with other lecturers maybe later so that they can get most out of it. So uh, we're waiting if uh, you should come to Afghanistan here. We'll be hosting you. Inshallah. So thank you so much. We will have you in our coming meetings, maybe in the council, academy council meeting sometime if it's needed. So wish you all the very best, very best in the end. I will also hear the Khuda uh, Hafez and the Farwell from our uh, left uh, chancellor. Uh, so you can directly see him. Thank thank you. You so much, uh, but you, you. Thank you very much. I wish yeah. you and your family safety as well and in good health, all of you. I will have a group photo from your side. Oh okay? yeah, let's, let's do a group photo. Let me put some perfume. Okay, look at the camera. <laughs> okay. All right, so that's it. Should I end the Zoom call now? Okay, we'll take one photo then you can end it. Okay. You take a photo. Ah, okay, I think you take it and send it to me because you're right now the owner okay. of all.
All right, so Manawi, look at the camera, uh, computer camera, Manawi. Okay, and then the, okay, so we'll look at the camera. One, yik, do say. <gasps> oh, okay, one more person, hold on. I think Ahmad just appeared on the video. Ahmad Zia Ahadi, can you turn on the camera again? Zia, Why not, sir, why not? Okay, yik, do say. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you so much, brother. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Sir.